and the sun is beaming through the skylights in a way that's somewhat distracting, but welcome back to another extravaganza because today I am going to tick -tick 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 wire up this workbench. Wire up this workbench, you say? Yes, yes, quite very much so. You see, if there's one thing that I tolerate less and less in life as I get older, it's disorganized electrical. Despite one's frugality, I am not content to just have a scatter of friggin' power bars and weird wires everywhere. I want this to be a nice functional workspace, which means I want the electrical to be accessible. So my plan is to run a bunch of various outlet boxes all along here so that I may have quick and ergonomic access to power when I need it. So for that, we have quite a variety of componentry. Unfortunately, the prices at my local supply house are efficient enough that this is not completely out there to do. Four receptacles in four handy boxes, conduit connectors. I have like one piece of conduit left that I didn't burn and little various scrap pieces that I'm hoping I'll be able to make use of. Now, because of the tight tolerances, I've invested in more of these, uh, these little uh, bendy bits because they make things convenient. And yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to put a wire between these guys. That is part and parcel of some secret sauce that I'm interested in investing in. So yeah, pretty straightforward. I just have to figure out where I want to put these boxes and you know, pop pipe between them. I'm not really gonna have to worry about doing a lot of complicated bends. It's pretty much just gonna be straight pipes. I'm not gonna bother with offsets across this and the only turns are gonna be, I wanna have a plug, but up against here, but you know, I got the 90s so that the pipe can just shoot directly out. So yeah, I brought the pipe bender for whatever reason. It's just like, oh, I'm doing conjuring, I must get the pipe bender. So where to start? Probably on this end. I'm going to utilize this receptacle down on this end and the main plug is gonna be on this end. I do find myself, when I used to work at this bench, working on this side of it for whatever reason. I guess because the doors are there and there was a lot going on. Where I will actually be doing most of my work on this bench in the future, I do not know. I do not know. Okay, so how high do I want these things? I don't want them too low. I don't want them too high. I kind of imagine them being kind of middle of the road here. So that would be middle of the road about there, probably out a bit. And then this box, I wanted it to be higher. So like up there. And then we ran into the situation where I got to connect these together. I got another offset. Usually these boxes, these three guys here, one of them's a little bit different. And even though these are made by the same manufacturer, I'm surprised that these holes didn't line up. So even though I wanted to pretty much directly connect two of these together, I can't, I got to use an offset. I don't want the offset to be centered because I don't like using the punch outs that have the, you know, the dual stage punch outs. If I can, I like putting it right in like that. That seems to go out somewhat central. So I guess we can make that work. Well, at any rate, I'm going to have to set some sort of precedent here. I'm going to have to maybe go like, oh boy, what is this? It's not quite 22 and a half, but we'll call it 22 and a half. So what's half of 22 and a half? Well, that's going to be 11 and a quarter, isn't it? Levens and quotas. So we'll make that our halfway point. We're going to do another measurement to establish where either the top or bottom of this box is going to go. So if that center box is going to sit nine and a half inches up, that's not like exact, but it'll be good enough. So we'll put a mark nine and a half inches, nine and a half inches. That's where our box is going to sit. That also means that's where the box is going to sit here, but we're going to fit that after. Fitting for kitten. Oh, I'm going to need our system. Oh yeah, you know. No, you don't know, I'm babbling. That's cool, man, that's cool. Should I pre-drill? I don't know. What it would it be like if I didn't? Oh, that stupid ground screw. Sticks out too far. Oh boy. You don't even need it because it's all conduit grounded. They also tend to get stuck on your bit. Milwaukee, did you see that? That was interesting. Wow. That screw really got stuck on there. Okay, let us try this again. Nine and a half, center it on there, nice. Maybe I should level this thing to make sure it's level. 
Do I have the level in here? I bet I don't. Just kind of eyeballing it. Okay, assuming of course, I'm gonna put a conduit connector right on the end here. All right, so let's uh, find a scrap piece of conduit here that, you know what? I don't think that's the longest piece of scrap conduit I have. Uh, I might be able to use it to bridge the gap there, assuming, yeah, that'll be too short, but. So part of the next plan here is to take one of these boxes. We better remove that damn green screw. And I'm gonna pop out the side, put in one of these elbows. Now, let's see if we can get one of these to time the way I want it to. Of course it's not gonna time the way I want it to. Of course it's gonna stick out in a way where I won't be able to screw it down after. So we'll go ahead and shim it up with um, a lock nut. Now let's see how it times. You know what, that'll be okay like that. I'll be able to get in from the top, Tighten that down and it won't completely interfere with this functionality. All right, so it's probably starting time to cut conduit. I gotta figure out how much length I'm gonna need here, which is gonna be tricky with this flimsy tape. 35 and a half inches, yeah? Yeah. 35 and a half. 35 and a half. 35 and a half. 35 and a half. I have the right tool with me, but I only brought one battery. So we're gonna be doing a little bit of swap skis around today, right? Ugh, 35 and a half. Remember to chamfer and deep burr kits. Oh, okay, that's great. Looks like it was more like 36. It's a bit loose, but the connection is made, so it's gonna be fine. Let's just go blast it in there now, right? Trying to see if it's relatively, yeah, close enough. Oh, that's loud with your head right next to it. Okay, that's not going anywhere now. So if I just do one of these, now it's just solid, but So, now that I'm looking at it, am I even gonna have enough room to fit that offset joint in here? Just, just. That actually works out, oi! That actually works out nicely because this thing's just a little bit over that way. And the way this offset's gonna sit in there, it's gonna put this central. So, punch it out. Okay. Tightening that up is gonna be a bitch, but okay. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and hammer that box down now. Okay, all right. And the wonderful thing about handy boxes is you can never get this in, so. Oh, lock nuts and handy boxes. We'll have to test the ground bond. I can't get that handy box nut any tighter, so. Worst case scenario, I run a ground wire between these two just to make sure it has a solid bond. There's a reason why, you know, you want those lock nuts on there tight. Like not, you know, torque wrench reef the hell out of them tight, but if you're doing conduit in this method, it is your ground wire. So let's give her a try at the other one here. Don't forget to remove the crystals. All right, so conveniently, we had diagonals going, like the screw positions here are diagonals. So like in every case, we're able to place this box in such a way where we can get a good purchase on this board. Now, before I put it into place, I'm gonna fit the conduit. Yeah, I kind of have to anyway. Hey, that was artistic. The way these connectors are designed, pretty much conduit goes right to the end. So you could measure from box to box and get a relatively accurate measurement on how much conduit you need. 26 inches, uh, we're gonna minus about one eighth of an inch. So 25 and whatever's short of 26. Does that even make sense? No, probably doesn't. So yeah, 26, go back an eighth, simple. Cause there is like a, about a 16th of an inch lip in there that has to be minded. Now this was the end of whatever conduit it came off of. So it's already clean. Let's get some connectors in place. All right. Looks like the geometry I need is not quite there. Okay, we'll pull the box. That's fine though. Kind of new to expect that. That's the reason why I didn't bother putting both screws in. There. Huh. There is literally like an eighth inch of slack. Maybe I'm just gonna go direct next time. All right, let's get another screw in this box. Ha ha, we're slowly inching our way towards the goal. Oh, oh, oh. What was that, man? All right, let's do up the last one. <laughs> the last box, huh? The last box. You wanna do the last box? Yeah, let's do the last box. Now let's check the timing on our last conduit connector. Ho, ho, ho. So survey says, hmm, you know what that'll do? 
I'll be able to access it. So, somewhere over here, I wonder if it's the same length. 37 and a half? 36 and a half. 36 and a half. It's Chamber and Bird again. Our last conduit connector. All right, are we ready for this? Let's hammer ham ski that down, Bob. You know what's ironic? The size of boxes is rated in milliliters. <laughs> Electrical measured in the same form as liquid. It's kind of ironic since water and power don't mix. All right. Yeah. So one of the pressing issues now is we need to officiate how power is going to come into here. So we have this, uh, this uh, strain relief connector that is going to be how our wire gets in there. And I'm going to use this 90 to make it so that it sits nice. Where am I going to put it? So I need it to go into here. I just realized these connectors on the side here have the little the things I don't like on them. Part of me wants to go like this, but over here. So then I'm like, well, how's that? No, sideways would be dumb. I gotta put it on the lower one. I'm not gonna use the upper one. The upper one is being reserved for a future expansion because I'm, I'm going to add more receptacles to this assembly. I want to have one that goes up here to power whatever computer I decide to set up here. I just haven't decided yet how I'm gonna implement that. I'll do that in the next stage. Now, before I go battening down this hatch, I'll give it a little snug. I need a cable to go in there. I guess we're just about ready to start wiring. <gasps> I'm going to be using 12 gauge. This entire thing is going to be 20 amp spec so that it can like be heavy duty. You probably noticed that on plain extension cords that don't have overload protection, they only have a maximum of three receptacles. As soon as you got something like a power bar like this, I guess technically could be, it needs to have a, a overload protection. Now, mind you, this is made to much higher standards than a power bar and I'm going full 12 gauge spec here, half because that's actually what I have to use with. I got a couple old extension cords that are chopped up that are 12 gauge and then uh, all the single or dual conductor wire I have in stock is 12 gauge. I have triple conductor 15, but then I would have too many wires. Contrary to popular belief, spec grade receptacles are pretty much all 20 gauge rated. If you rip the face off most spec grade receptacles, you'll see T-slot prongs in there. The internal design is going to be identical. And you can't quote me on that because you're not about to go use 15 amp receptacles on 20 gauge services. The main plug going into the wall isn't going to be T-slot. But I'm only plugging this into a 15 amp circuit. I'm just mostly just overbuilding this so it, this will never be a problem. Seen here is a scrap 12 gauge extension cord and of course all the 12 gauge Nomex. Someone gave this to me because it was a write off. Like it's totally, it needs new ends if it's ever going to get used again. Like look, this guy is kind of and I think, oh well, that's not so bad. This one's fraying quite badly and it's got some, you know, some overload on it. Now I'm seeing a piece of tape right here which suggests that might be damage. Now if I cut it to this length, is that going to be enough to go from there? That might actually be lots. I don't need long. I just want it to go to the receptacle right there and not have a whole bunch of slack hanging off. Let's see what it looks like under here. Oh yeah, a little bit of damage. So we'll call it good right there. I'm going to try cutting it there and see what happens. Oh boy, this stuff's tough. That's good. That's the way we want it. And of course, we got to get rid of this guy. And well, sadly, that can go right into the garbage. So what do we have here underneath all this tank? Yeah, they were trying to uh, fix up a little fray, but that's just going to get stripped off. Let's confirm that this is going to be the right length that we need. So let's pretend that that's going through there, probably about that much. And then we'll, yeah, it's going to reach no problem. Now, the funny thing is it's not technically to code to do something like this. You see, this is not DIY rated cable. I'm talking about SW00J extension cord cable that you can get from the hardware store. That's your DIY cable. It's UL listed for DIY use. This is an extension cord that got cut. And even if it used identical cable, as soon as you cut an extension cord, you void its UL listing. So an inspector won't allow you to use it as a device cord. Or at least that's how the inspector explained it to me once when he called me on a device that I made using a cut extension cord. Now this guy right here needs to come apart. You know, I didn't even measure when I stripped that. I just arbitrarily stripped it. That's going to be about right for this. Someone is working some machine outside that's rattling my brain. All right. The actual stripping process. Don't need to take. Thanks, Obama. Don't need to take very much off these. 
in this rather cheap looking, yeah, I don't really like this plug, but I guess I have it now. Might as well use it. Wow, this is a cheap friggin' plug. I'm never gonna buy another one of these plugs. It got the job done, but it's not to my standards. It should be fine once I get it put together. Okay, so we got a plug in now. Ready to go. So now the other end is going to need significantly more strip because we're going to need some slack to move around. So for the hot and neutral, they're going to go in back wire style. So we need but a snippet. The ground is being treated a little bit differently because you can't wrap stranded wire around a binding post. That's where these little dillies come in. Some forks. But I might not be able to use these ones because I don't think a 12 gauge wire is gonna fit in there. Wait, will it? Like I know the blue ones are rated for 14 gauge. I don't know if they'll do 12. Uh, it did push back some conductors though. And I don't have my crimping tool here either. So I'm like, what good is this even gonna do me? I think we'll be okay. Worst case scenario, what you do is you merit it to a solid wire and then that solid wire sets up. That or I suppose I could back wire it to the device and then it'll ground through the attachment. That might be a nice way to do it. If you haven't noticed, this is an AFCI. AFCI blank face. They're rated for 20 amps, so it fits in the spec. They put the cover on it, even though that's useless because you will always have to pull these off because these are specifically designed for downrange protection. So I have to put the extension cord online and then everything's gonna feed off the load side. So hopefully this reaches. Which side is which? Oh, it's gotta go up, eh? It should. I'll pull a little bit more slack through and maybe I should strip off a bit more. All right, that should be lots now. So let's get the strain relief in place. That should do nicely, sir. I guess we should start the wiring. And of course, because I don't want ground wire in there, I guess I could. What am I worried about ground loops here? Yeah, I'm always worried about ground loops. Ground loops are to be voided at all costs. At least that's how I was trained. So that means I have to strip off the insulation off a bunch of this wire again. I'm gonna start off this party by pulling back the ground line. And I'm gonna start fishing this cable through here, which is actually a rather difficult angle, isn't it? You know what? Screw it. I'm trying to debate exactly how artistic I wanna do this because I get a bit carried away. Yeah, no, we'll be here all day. So, oh, something's bottoming out. I don't think it wants to go around that corner. Yeah, I remember now. Those little 90s are tricky to get through. Oh, I just can't get it around that 90. <laughs> Which is all fine and dandy on this box, I can pull it off, but it might be tricky over there. Who knows, maybe that 90 will be more forgiving. Okay, so now can we get it through the 90? Maybe, just maybe. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, on the menu this evening, leftover receptacles. You see, I bought a 10 pack, but only needed five. So I have quite a few left. And it was one of the incentives in doing this. Just got to stripolate this and jam them in there, bud. All right, I'll pull back just a little bit of slack and then we'll start a fold. All right, that's one. Shouldn't be hard to get two going. Oh boy, weight's being a nuisance. There we go, slack them. That looks appropriately slacked. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and keep this wire train rolling. What's it gonna take to get it past that other 90? Oh boy. I forgot how much of a pain in the arse these 90s are. I'm gonna try going in from this side again to see if I can kind of hook it around. Okay. Oh, maybe not. Or, okay, it's going. We'll be good. Oh, we bottomed out against the connector. So we got there, but now we have that classic situation where maybe this time I can grab onto them. I'm gonna acquire various implements. Come on now. I see you right there. Just, just, just out of reach. Oh okay, I got black. Oh, fuck you, bud. Okay. Yeah, those 90s are a bear, but it's through. That slack's about good. Let's cut slack over here and then We'll finish trim this off. Copper wire, it comes in handy sometimes. Now, instead of uh, uh, digging around and cutting more of this fresh cable, I went to the scrap bin and found some definitely 12 gauge leads. Uh, we have a red color code, but uh, for my application, who gives a damn, right? I'm gonna start putting some receptacles in. Yes, I think so. And of course, these receptacles support double back wiring, so we only need to use one lug. All right, it's a uh, folder into place. 
Next. Now I've spared you the duplicate process all the way around down the line, but this is where things change. When you have a conduit coming out the top of something, chances are the threading's gonna conflict with this general screw hole right here. And you need to have some shorter screws on file to overcome that obstacle. Mm -hmm. So now the AFCI, loosen up all the screws. There's one side labeled line and another side labeled load. This is load. It goes on the load side. Now. Let's get our power feed into place. We'll just let it dip down here. So that's about where it's gonna go. We'll let it go position directly down. Directly dog down, sir. These need to come out. Wait, how the hell? What the f What it, huh? That's a Decora plate. But these screws line up with those install screws, not those holes. How the hell do they want you to install this? Do they expect you to have a sub plate and sandwich it? Okay, uh, I guess I need some 632 nuts. I've never encountered that before. Fortunately, the local Canadian tire was still open and I knew they'd have something as basic as a 632 nylon lock nut. Hopefully that's not too wide for the application because we're getting, nah, it'll be good. And of course that will mate with these plate screws. That was a bit of a, a side swipe. I did not see that coming. Did not see that coming. Moving right along, we're gonna get these wires into place. And these guys are nicely, they have back wiring to them. So I can just put that in there like that. Can twist that up a little bit better, a little bit better. And we're putting that on the load side, right? So remember, this is my white wire. It just got painted red, so. And I'm gonna cheat and keep ground real friggin' simple. I'm just gonna attach it to the back wire on here. That way I don't need any fancy connectors or adapters. All right, let's manually double check all these connections. Yes, yes, oh, that one needed more. Yeah, okay. How about this side? Yeah, yeah, all right. So, what we're gonna have to do next is break the wings off this, uh, this particular implement. These are definitely gonna get in the way. Now this little pishnut here that normally holds your decor plate online. Um, I'm wondering if I just kinda force this in here, they will bend back nicely. I don't think so. So I'm gonna give them a little manual bend back like this and like this. Might still need a bit more. All right, new. Yeah. We had to buy an entire package of lock washers for two. Isn't that how it goes? Or not lock washers, lock nuts. That's all right, I don't mind the idea of bolting this on. Bolting this on this way makes me feel more comfortable with the grounding method that I'm using. Oh, this one's gonna be harder to grab. Okay, good. That's not going anywhere now. We're almost done, man. We're almost done, people. I just gotta remove these bolts or screws more accurately, quite possibly. Then, you know, there's plenty of room in here, so this should tuck in with not too much fuss. Okay, scratch the fuss. Because of these cheap quality components. Or just me having a hard time aligning it, right? It's always operator error. Now, this is complete. I wanna get this behind this rail, so that hopefully we pull this back enough. Oh. Just drop this all over. I knew I was gonna, I knew I was gonna drop something. Well, you know what I'm gonna do now? Right down here, just the right amount of slack. So, for testing porpoises, because the testing porpoises are very demanding, I'm gonna plug in this lamp. This lamp you can barely see when it's running. I'm gonna turn it on, you're gonna notice, <gasps> no power, because the AFCI. We have a problem. That's suspicious. We're getting an AFCI fault, okay. Why would we get an AFCI fault? Line, load, yeah. Everything there is connected properly. There's nothing connected wrong. I don't think you can reset these while they're turned off. That's weird, it works now. Let's try plugging the lamp back in. Maybe I just didn't press it hard enough. Let's get that stupid thing back into place. Yeah, I think I just didn't press it hard enough. It's new, might have needed some breaking in. That made the whole uh, process of turning it on for the first time a lot less epic. Well, bud, that's pretty much that. From start to finish, or finish from start. I'm going all the way through to the end. Green cable, plugs in, everything's good to go. And you're probably wondering, 
Why AFCI? Doesn't AFCI suck? Well, yeah, no, maybe. I, uh, when I did the electrical in my house, brought it completely up to 2018 code. Everything's AFCI'd in there that modern code would require. That's one of the reasons why I had that AFCI blank face. I bought like a five pack of those to solve some problems in the house for circuits I wanted to AFCI a specific way. Eh, I have two left. That's one of them. So I already had the thing. So I'm like, well, I might as well use it because it seems like a good idea in here. I didn't want AFCI on the main shed power runs, right? Let's face it. Some power tools will nuisance trip AFCI, definitely. I know for a fact my miter saw will nuisance trip a Siemens AFCI combination breaker, which is also one of the reasons why I chose to use conduit. By putting the wires in that kind of mechanical armor, you uh, circumvent the need for AFCI. Otherwise yeah, I think if I was using um, Nomex in here, doing some very basic bitch ways of wiring a shed, I, AFCI probably would have been required. Now on the workbench, its use case is a bit different than the general receptacles. The general receptacles, I'm gonna plug in a heavy duty power tool. I'm gonna to unplug it when I'm done. This guy, I might have things like this stupid lamp left plug in. I might have uh, power tool chargers. Definitely that's something that I might plug in and walk away, lock it up for the night. But you know, at some point I might be doing some soldering here. I might have a drill press. I might, you know, there, there's a number of things I could find myself doing on here with tools, swinging them around, sharp bits where I could end up spiking a wire like that lamp Wire. Under circumstances like that, it is very beneficial for me to have that AFCI because it will detect that arc, it will detect that spark, it'll detect that short circuit at a threshold of, well, in the case of that guy, maybe about an amp. It's not gonna require the full 15 amps to pop the protection. Yeah, the AFCI threshold on those blank faces, those levited blank faces, is a bit higher than I'd like them to be. It's freaking 35 milliamps on a, a combination uh, Siemens, but it's, it's all about fire prevention at this point. If I'm gonna spike a wire and have a spark, it's most likely to happen up here. And I'm gonna remind you that this thing is made out of wood, and not only is it made out of wood, but it's made out of motor oil soaked wood. So yeah, maybe a little bit of spark prevention on this old bench is uh, yeah, a good idea. It's also worth mentioning that that style of arc fault device, I have tested that Levitin, is a lot more sensitive to series arcing. Something like a Siemens breaker is more sensitive to parallel arcing. Those are the ones I'm used to that I've tested. They will instantly pop if something touches ground, if hot touches ground, but they won't have as much sensitivity of direct short between hot and neutral. They'll let more current pass before they fault that out. This one, they have a much lower threshold. If you have a direct short between a hot and neutral, like you might be likely to have in a double insulated type device or type cable, this is more likely to detect that. So I prefer that method of arc fault in applications where I'm gonna have a lot of random stuff plugged into a circuit and I wanna make sure nothing goes wrong with that. So this is actually a perfect application for it. And it's the reason why some of the arc faulting I did in the house, I used those instead of your standard breaker because I preferred the kind of protection that that was gonna give me for that application. So I'm not sure what to say now. I just finished cleaning up getting all the refuse off the floor, putting the tools away. And now I'm left with an empty room. There's light, there's heat, there's ventilation. Everything works, everything's done. For all intents and purposes, this is finished. And now I don't know what to do. It's cold out, the season's ending. It's not appropriate to be getting into any the kind of projects that I plan to do with this building, so. I guess we'll see. But I kind of feel like the end of that episode is South Park. You know, the one where they're playing World of Warcraft and they, I guess, spent all summer break leveling up so they could beat that boss guy who was stifling them. And then when they finally conquered him, they're like, well, what do we do now? Now we can finally play the game. I've got one left. It will most likely be used up later on when I'm ready to do up.